in your kind of introduction. Um, in a way, you, you set a challenge here. Um, how do you make unique courses um, and how do you protect that content? And I suppose I, I started to think about where we are in higher education um, today in, in the UK, but more broadly. Um, so I'm going to talk, I suppose, um, at a distance initially um, from uh, those courses, and then I'll move closer and closer um, to those courses and uh, give some examples of my own experience. Um, to give you a bit of context, um, some of you may know me um, from a slightly, a slightly different context, uh, for running a MOOC, um, well, a few years back now, on vampire fictions that, that happened to be, as it turned out, the first, um, well, four-credit MOOC in the UK. Uh, and that's where my passion really is from a subject pers perspective in gothic fiction and, and vampire fiction. Um, but my role has changed slightly now. Um, so with this in mind, I, I want to lay out um, what I'm going to do uh, today. I, I want to start by thinking about how disruption has taken place uh, within in higher education it's, and how it's still taking place. I want to think about those, those, those words around unbundling and rebundling, um, particularly when it comes to, to course design. And thinking, I suppose, more, more broadly about that, how that process impacts upon unique content and unique courses and making them distinctive as a result of the pressures that that process of unbundling um, has put upon um, institutions across, across the globe. Then I want to think specifically about some key trends, um, thinking about disruptive technologies and disruptive innovation, and I suppose the new sort of blueprint that we might all have as educators um, in the back of our minds when, when, we're, when we're planning courses and what we have to respond to, what are the expectations, and, and perhaps also um, how those expectations are aligned with, with a student experience. Um, and I suppose that also leads further into the presentation around what, what students want. Um, and part of that, I think, is obviously how we use digital technologies, but how we might imagine the digital student. Um, and moving beyond debates around digital native and di digital immigrant, but thinking about how we might connect that idea of the digital student to the digital citizen, uh, particularly as we think about digital literacies and fluencies uh, and digital economies, and what a digital student might look like, um, if not today, then in five years' time, in ten years' time. And so that idea of planning ahead um, through uh, emerging uh, trends and, and technologies at this moment in time and how that might impact upon uh, future course developments. And then finally, I'm going to end um, with an exploration of, of a particular example, again, from, from my own research interests, um, how we've personalised learning, um, how we go about that process of personalising learning, um, and give a very specific example that I'll explore in more detail later before concluding with perhaps a few uh, headline recommendations that might open up debate further. But let's go back first to my uh, musings, my ruminations around what the process of um, disruptive innovation and bundling and un well, unbundling and bundling, rebundling uh, of education might be all about. And, and I was trying to put this down sort of schematically on paper and think about um, it as a process, a cycle. And it's, it's problematic uh, if we try and think where HE is today. Um, but I think what we can recognise is disruptive innovation is certainly asking universities to question uh, their business models. And one example of that, as we've been hearing earlier today, um, is the MOOC or MOOCs and how they've impacted upon how we understand higher education um, in particular, how that has disrupted those very fixed and, and bundled models, how MOOCs are part of that process of, of unbundling. Um, and in, the, in that scenario, I suppose, as we start to... Um, feel that pressure of disruptive innovation. Institutions are having to respond. And I think that there's a direct link between disruptive innovation and institutional brands and, and drivers and how institutions are trying to reposition themselves. Um, talking about different partnerships earlier between you know, Liverpool and Laureate or um, FutureLearn and its various partners. Um, that there are new players um, you know, and new, new relationships, I suppose, emerging that perhaps couldn't have been fully imagined even, you know, even uh, five years ago. Um, so there is the sense here that um, there's a jostling, uh, I suppose, for market position and a reimagining of what institution, institutional brands and, and drivers really, really are as a result of disruptive innovation. At the same time, in that process of unbundling, um, thinking about new, new players within the system and new, new companies in the system and whether it is... Um, in partnership with the existing HE providers or, or whether it's um, 
um, in institutions, I suppose, that are sort of fresh to the HE market, uh, and, and I suppose in a slightly different context, um, that whole narrative around private colleges um, and, and questions of quality there and, um, is, is, is a different, I suppose, trajectory. But I suppose what this has opened up is how we might understand the process of, of putting this all back together again. And this leads me to uh, further down, I suppose, this schematic of how we re rebundle higher education, how universities, institutions put it all back together again. Um, I suppose it's like the, sort of the Humpty Dumpty scenario. Uh, we, you know, we, we fall off the wall and the king's horses and the king's men will, will come along and, and try and imagine what, it, what it's like, like to, to put, put that egg back together again. Uh, how would it be reformed? Um, so out of those, out of those pressures, um, out of those, um, um, I suppose, specific pressures around disruptive innovation, there are debates here around the, I suppose, limits of institutions um, around open access, OER. There are also debates around, I suppose, the role of the academic within this schematic. And I think that sometimes there is this disjunction between what, what might be projected as an institutional brand and actually what's happening on the ground, how academics experience that, how academics actually make that brand. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Moving on. Um, I have to always check behind me, uh, make sure that technology is working. Uh, with that in mind, I, I was going back through some of the sort of key trends that have emerged and I, I, I suppose as a caveat to this, I, I owe a lot to figures like Mike Sharples and you know, colleagues at Open University that have been exploring various sort of innovations in pedagogy and um, identifying trends. But I think we should have these in mind as we start to revisit those questions of, of, of course design. Um, I suppose we, we start with massive open social learning and, and perhaps you know, on the one hand the MOOC is, MOOC is dead but on the other hand you know, long live the MOOC. But there is something within, within the MOOC um, in the processes of, of social learning that we can embrace and that sort of networked, networked effect of education um, in an open uh, environment on a massive scale is something that is um, truly powerful and appealing. And, and in a way the conversations that can be opened up there um, have, I suppose, yet to fully be realised, particularly, I suppose, around um, what we might learn, um, thinking sort of further down the list, around those questions of analytics and um, learning design informed by analytics. In a way, we're only, only at the very much beginning of that road, or certainly in the last 18 months, you could say that that door has opened. Um, so that networked effect of, of social learning and the power of analytics in, in course design is, is becoming, I suppose, ever too obvious um, from my own experience at at NTU, um, you, you may have seen that they that NTU won um, an Open Times Higher Award for a student support, and, and that focused on a, on a dashboard, a student dashboard that allows students to, to, to track their engagement, um, and it looks at all kinds of aspects of engagement from each time they go into the library to when they download a resource, time spent on different aspects of the VLE. And it maps that alongside their performance, the actual grades they're getting in their assessments. And, and that, that type of data, that type of sort of management of the, the tracking and I suppose engagement experience of learning is, is very powerful. And we can start to see differences between different schools, different faculties, and how, how students learn with, within different disciplines. And, and, and that is feeding back into how we design courses. Further down the list, I, I suppose some of them are perhaps more, more obvious to us, uh, the power of the, the flipped classman. I, I always put that as a sort of question mark against that. I, I wonder why it's become, in a way, the sort of gold standard. I can understand how it can set up learning, but it, it can, in many ways, just be uh, another way, I suppose, of sort of just packaging um, the lecture. And, and at its worst, it, it, it really is nothing more than that. Um, so it's how we might use flip technology um, more broadly. And, and again, I, I'll revisit that later. Going further down on this, the, the double, double, double loop learn, learning and the double looped learner is, is an interesting concept. And I think that what we're looking at here is, is the ideal learner in many ways, the learner that reflects upon um, not just what they've learned, but the actual structure and, and um, process of learning. Uh, there are the there are self-determined learners that, in a, in a way, uh, make it to the end of MOOCs. And I, I'm sure there are lots of um, stories around, around the room here of uh, all of us signing up for MOOCs and, and not making it to the end. So that, that double loop learning process is something you need to work harder on um, to make and, and uh, make sure that um, our learners are reflecting upon the process of learning as they, as they move through um, their, their educational journey. 
Bring your own devices. Yes, I think this is also changing the dynamic of how, how we design courses. And you know, it's, it's, it's been around, I suppose, in, in various forms for some time. But I, I suppose hearing earlier um, you know, from FutureLearn and, and the Open University around um, you know, OU Anywhere and the power of putting uh, a university in your pocket, um, for those who have access to that technology, that, that is, is a powerful narrative that we need to be aware of um, in terms of how we design courses. Dynamic assessment as well is something uh, that, it, that is key here, that we are not just uh, offering a one-size-fit-all uh, model of learning or education, but also uh, equally not just a one-size-fit-all model of, of assessment, assessment that actually adapts to the learner, that actually, um, as we start to learn about those, those unknown learners, particularly in, in, in MOOCs and in an open context, that we can tailor assessment to the level or ability of those learners. And, and dynamic assessment, I think, is, is something, again, we, we need to work more on. And then this leads me on to the, the last two. Um, and in, in a way, they're in, going in very different directions. Uh, Event-based learning, uh, something that can happen uh, as a result of uh, a particular sort of moment in, in time, and I suppose, uh, or perhaps a historical celebration, uh, an anniversary. There is certainly that um, sense that MOOCs are, some MOOCs are, are tapping into that idea of event-based learning. Uh, that there's something going on at that particular time that, that, that warrants particular scrutiny that might be not necessarily mapped within a broader curriculum that might sit alongside it to enhance it. And then finally, I suppose, we're coming full circle or with ideas around bricolage and putting us all back in the sandpit and learning again as, as children, um, you know, gi giving our learners um, uh, cardboard boxes and, and, and see what they come up with. So that narrative of, of, of transformation um, is, is all, all too, I suppose, in my mind's eye, um, you know, reappropriation, taking learning materials and, and reappropriating them, re reimagining them in a different context. From here, I, I suppose I started to think more about the digital student, and, and this seems a very sort of messy schematic in some ways, but I, I suppose I'm just sort of brainstorming, I suppose, in some ways. And, and I was thinking about the, the nature of the digital student and the type of digital skills that. that children from as young as five are being asked to acquire. Uh, I have this um, nagging feeling in the back of my mind that uh, my son, who's going to turn uh, five years old next year, is going to be coding, and he's probably going to be better at coding by the age of six uh, than I am. Uh, and then alongside that, um, narratives around digital thinking, um, that perhaps it requires something different different from all of us, but particularly uh, as we start to imagine what a digital student might be around the way we think, um, that there might be a new... Um, sense of, of, of supple, flexible, and perhaps responsive uh, thinking that's required within a digital environment. Um, if, if learning is being packaged in a different way, then, then the way we approach that learning needs to be reimagined. And there's, some, there's obviously lots of useful literature in, the, uh, in, in this area, but um, I, I put a couple of quotations up there. That idea of, uh, from Hirsch, of, from, from the idea of radical individualism, um, to that hacker ethos of collectivity and collaboration. Uh, this comes out of a text, actually, within my own discipline in the digital humanities and looking at digital humanities pedagogy. But that's a nice idea, uh, that there's something um, that requires in all of us to change the way that we imagine our relationship with knowledge and, and learning, uh, that it is about a sense of collectivity and collaboration, not just perhaps in name, but actually in action as well. Um, and this feeds in, I suppose, also to ideas of the network self and socially constructive knowledge, which can often be tremendously scary for academics, that, um, that, that idea of the sage on the stage, even though we, we stand here now talking in that way, um, is somehow being um, shifted um, to knowledge constructed on, on a massive scale, a knowledge shared and curated on a massive scale. This might challenge, in a way, um, those, those narratives of quality, the, the very sort of con conception of an academic and a Socratic model might be undermined. Um, I, I think perhaps I would think differently here. It could, and it will, and it is being enhanced. This leads me further down this cycle as we start to think about the digital skills that for um, students, but also for staff, that it can often be scary for staff as, as well as students to think about digital literacy, but, but also digital fluency, that um, somehow staff might think that they're lacking in, in so many ways. But I would say the playing field is, is more equal than, than staff imagine. And digital fluency is, is actually more widely spread than staff would perhaps like to believe. This then leads, I think, more broadly into these narratives of, of a digital economy and how we might prepare students for what will be an increasingly expanding digital economy and more broadly, even than the digital economy, is how we might understand citizenship in, in a digital age or era. 
This then leads me, I suppose, back and, or further down into this process. I start to drill into this and to think more about what personal learning environments might actually be. And although the, the title, I suppose, of this whole section of, of today's, um, I suppose, debate is around course content and unique courses, I am perhaps more sceptical around um, how um, unique content is. And perhaps as we imagine uh, what uh, Silkstrom and Westerland um, describe as a move from content related to process involved learning and, and they're talking actually in the context of, of, uh, of PG uh, supervision, postgraduate supervision actually in terms of, uh, of a blending learning but I think it applies more broadly that, that that sense of process involved learning is very much what we're all confronting here um, that, that digital technologies, digital education asks us to revisit those processes the way we actually package content that in many ways content is, is open. And I think that um, when, I, when I think about when Edinburgh did one of their first MOOCs and there was a little bit of controversy because they didn't put that sage on the stage. They referred student, students to open content, whether it was on YouTube or, or just on the web. And the, the, the initial feedback was, where is the lecturer? And so, so I wonder whether in that our understanding of content we need to think more about the processes in, in, in which we actually um, explore and acquire that knowledge in the content, how we can experience that education. And I think this is quite a useful quotation from Mark Sample. Um, and, it and it links back to questions, I suppose, of bricolage. Uh, and this is actually the, the title of this piece is uh, um, What's Wrong with Writing Essays? Uh, which, which is very relevant to, to my discipline. Um, so he, some sample says, I am moving away from asking students to write towards asking them to weave, and I think this applies more broadly to what we do, to build, to fabricate, to design. I don't want my students to become miniature scholars. Um, this is debatable. Uh, I want them to be aspiring uh, Rauschenbergs, um, so that, that sense of, you know, sort of using different mediums you know, in art is important there. Assembling mixed media compositions all the while through their engagement with uh, seemingly incongruous materials, and I think that's an interesting idea, how you put the incongruous together and how we, we learn from, from different disciplines as we put, put the seemingly incongruous together. Developing a critical thinking practice about the process and the product at the same time. And that, that again, is about that idea of the, uh, the double-looped uh, learning, uh, learner and double-looped learning. So again, I suppose what we're asking ourselves here is, what does the weave look like? Uh, and this gets me back to, I suppose, my disciplinary sort of context. Uh, and I want to give one example here from a project that, that I was involved in um, from my own um, research interests and specialisms within uh, gothic fiction and vampire fiction. Uh, and I, I on the back of this slide, I suppose, is, is, is a text that some of you may be familiar with, um, Dracula. Um, and this comes out of an HEA project um, called Egothesis, and it was exploring the relationship in the broader sense between our study of English literature and e-learning, but with a specific focus um, in terms of my interests on, on Gothic fiction. Um, because Gothic fiction has, has a particular, I suppose, relationship with a concept, I suppose, that we're all familiar with, uh, threshold concepts and the power of threshold concepts to um, instigate um, change within, within the learner. And part of that project designed, um, in a way, a personal library for students. Uh, students um, could um, access at a modular level all their texts in, in that what in many ways is a now familiar um, electronic form. Um, but these are multimedia, um, media-rich texts that brought the learning materials to the text. Uh, alongside that, students can populate those sites. They can take ownership. They can share materials. And that was one important part of that. So using that idea of social learning, not over there on a VLE or through a partner, but actually within the text. Um, you're bringing it you know, right to, to hand. So there is that sense there that, you know, that, that students, if they had that idea while in, you know, in the middle of the night, um, in bed, while reading Dracula, they could share it. They could uh, enter into discussion. They could create discussion as well as um, engage, engaging in threaded discussion as well. So in, in many ways, those students on that project were involved in co-design and co-creation. Uh, part of that's a partnership. And I suppose what comes out of this is, again, where we locate ownership, ownership of content, ownership of, of the process and the product, and how the academic's role, again, we've been hearing about this earlier today and more broadly within uh, much uh, academic literature on this, on how we curate knowledge, um, but at the level, within the context of this disciplinary approach, um, how we can cur curate knowledge at the level of uh, texts in, in, in all their shapes and forms. This leads me, I suppose, then, further into this debate around where, where, this, where this takes us and how we might understand 
a personal learning environment and what that means to individual students within each discipline. If we're appealing to ideas around co-creation and co-design, um, we need to think more about what our students want and that those disciplinary boundaries and I suppose in that, that mashup of, of texts uh, that we're asking um, students to, to, to engage in, in terms of bringing sort of different media to represent uh, what they see in terms of theme and in terms of concepts within a text, you know, for example, here like Dracula, um, can actually spark new avenues of debate and that content and knowledge can be created uh, you know, once again, I suppose, um, at, you know, through, through close reading, um, which see, it seems ironic in, in, in some ways that I, I would uh, advocate the, the, the merits of close reading while also advocating the whole idea of uh, the network itself as uh, moving away from, I suppose, a very sort of singular relationship with the text. But I th think where this leads, uh, and, and certainly in terms of the, the scalability of uh, the personal uh, at a module level, is in that, th that narrative of sharing, in that narrative of both understanding more about the learner, but also understanding more about, again, how, how we create, curate knowledge at that very sort of personal level. And this, again, links back to that, those, those ideas around tailoring assessment to the student's needs. So in, in this project um, for the HEA, and, 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 it's, and it's still ongoing, um, there, there are m multiple levels here at work here. So in, in, in the context of a, of a UK uh, system, um, levels four, five and six, all, all at work at the same time and different tasks being set within a text at different levels. They're all, all of course, reading the same text, but they find different paths through it at different levels. This then leads me on, perhaps, to some, some recommendations, and, and they're by no means exhaustive, uh, and they might just be there to um, encourage further debate. Uh, but what comes out of all of this is, I suppose, knowing, in many cases, that unknown learner, uh, and finding out more about that unknown learner through analytics, through, through the data, how students learn, um, what, what their needs are. Um, in a way, um, in traditional experience, uh, undergraduate experience, we know our learners up to a point. Uh, but we know a lot more about them once, once they move into their degree and through their degree. Um, in an open and, and massive context, we know very little about our learners until, until they're fully engaged in that process. So that's key in course design in terms of how, how we make courses unique and distinct. The other element of this, as I've already been touching upon, is to promote ownership. Um, that is the, the great power of, of networked learning, uh, that, that um, our, our learners can take ownership of, of that knowledge, um, that academics, in a way, don't have the preserve of it. And in, in, a, in a narrative that might see a ne next ref cycle opening up monographs and uh, having far more focus on, on open resources, you know, OER, um, that isn't something to be, I think, scared of. It's something to, to engage in and share. And then finally... Again, this leads me back to the first side, how we might manage that, that process of, of rebundling um, at an institutional level, but actually within a faculties, within departments, um, between academics and students, that there is something quite scary in the processes of rebundling, that actually we might seem to lose control. But actually, again, I think that it's actually a great liberator, that we can actually rely upon colleagues, which we do on every, every day at different institutions through our networks, to, sh to share that learning experience and repackaging it, and perhaps not, I suppose the caveat to this is perhaps not to be so uh, possessive in how, how we, uh, um, um, I suppose, label uh, knowledge and, and try and keep control of knowledge uh, and um, break down those boundaries and, and open up um, doorways. Uh, and I think this is, I suppose, where I'll leave you on that thought that in, in that narrative of openness, um, there is an opportunity here um, to, to rebundle higher education through a truly strong, blended mix of, of different learning environments and, and different opportunities, different pathways for different learners. And that has to surely be embraced. Thank you Thank for you. your time. <coughs> now, uh, a great many questions, uh, particularly on vampires and gothic. And go there. I, I know you all want to ask what he does at weekends, <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid I'm not going to allow that one.